realizing the value of online fans. Now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Kitty Bu in Shanghai. Today we'll bring you another episode of Thoughtful, sponsored by Weibo, China's leading microblogging platform to help marketers understand this market's social media environment and use it more effectively to build online relationships with local consumers. If you'd like to hear more from the speakers in the sponsor series, Weibo is hosting a discussion site where viewers can interact with our guests and other industry members. You can access this site through the QR code on the screen or through Thoughtful's Weibo account at the link below. In this episode, our panelists Karen Ho, Hedy Wen, and Sam Flemin will explore performance marketing through social media and find out how brands can unleash the real value in fans through social commerce and social CRM efforts. And Ken Hong will share a thought or two about best practices building social commerce in China. But first with us in the studio today is Simon Ashwin, Managing Director of Mindshare China. Simon, welcome to the studio. So today we're talking about how to connect and engage our online fans, not just from the perspective of branding, but also from sales. You know, platforms like Weibo are now adding uh, payment systems, um, which will disrupt the way in which many companies have uh, thought about path to purchase. Um, up until now. So are you hearing about the importance of social commerce from your clients in China? Yeah, absolutely. Over the last, say, 12 to 18 months, there's been a heightened level of activity with our clients around the social commerce space. Uh, I see that there's probably three key factors driving that um, and a lot of secondary ones that, that influence it as well. But primarily, it's you know, a rationalization or a softening of the, the growth rates that we see in China. Um, with that, though, we see that our clients are still expected to deliver high performance results with stagnant or declining marketing budgets. Secondly, it's what I would see is the maturation of understanding from clients about social, social media, what it can deliver for the business. Obviously, in the early days, there was the, the great fan race where every brand was trying to get the biggest number of fan followers uh, across their social media accounts. Whereas now there's a much deeper understanding that it's not necessarily about the quantity but about the quality of those fans and how they're going to be activated to achieve brand or business objectives. And I think complementing that, it's also an understanding that there's a lot more conversations happening around brands off branded sites than on their own Weibo's, WeChat accounts and so forth. So the, the breadth of social media, particularly in a market like China, is far more dynamic than anywhere else. And thirdly, it's the evolution of technology in China. In many ways, in fact, in most ways, we, we lead the world in social platforms. And we've seen social platforms now become forays into commerce. And we've seen e-commerce platforms now make forays into social media as well. So we're seeing a blurring of those lines. And I think those three factors are probably driving not just a heightened interest, but having our clients also delve into the social commerce space. Can you talk a little bit about how Mindshare is designing um, social media campaigns that have a strong angle on sales? either just retail or e-commerce? Yeah, I mean, our, our social media campaigns predominantly sit within a broader paid owned and owned framework with a, a larger campaign wrapped around that. And when we talk about how we deploy social commerce in that context, it's probably interesting to note that we don't see social commerce as a simple click to buy style approach. Uh, social commerce or shoppable media as we call it, is looking at ways that we can lead consumers and engage with them across the entire funnel. And that could be ways of deploying traditional media uh, and mobile devices to enhance that consumer journey and deliver different content at different points throughout that campaign period. Uh, having said that, when it, does, when it does come to like driving commerce sales, we're looking at how not just social media, but other touch points can complement that as well. So for some clients that might be deploying QR codes with a scan to, to receive additional content, and then from that having shareable options or through to a, a deep landing page. Are there any examples you can share from working with uh, brands in China, uh, brands who are trying to basically build, build up their sales or their social CRM through social media? Yeah, I can think of, of two probably off the top of my head which, which take very different approaches, so different ends of the same spectrum. One, one client is, is very well known globally for delivering very heavy, impactful branding campaigns. And through that, though, what we're looking at doing through a shop or media approach with them is driving the community's growth through multiple touch points in media 
and then within that having engagement metrics that drive through to sale as well from a, a social point. Another client on the other hand is, is really disrupting internally the way that they approach sales and marketing. They're moving away from a traditional distribution sales outlet uh, approach and have now gone wholly into e-commerce. And with that, social commerce plays a large role in regards to understanding different consumer dynamics across different tiers and the different interest points in a brand territory sense that we can be engaging with. So they've gone from a supermarket to very much a 100% e-commerce approach using data at the heart of what they're doing. If you're seeing a shift in the role of social media, uh, does that mean that the KPIs of the campaigns you're building are also changing? Absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the movement from the great fan race into driving more quality engagements means that the KPIs need to move with that. If we're looking at driving sales and, and you look at the, the broader purchase funnel, it's everything from time spent on site, time spent with content, uh, the shareability or searchability of that content through to conversion rates on site as well. So from a media perspective, we're not just looking at reach and frequency in the top level, but in fact the data that contributes all the way through to the end purchase. Simon, thanks for joining us today. Let's take a quick break, then we'll hear from Ken Hong, General Manager of Marketing Strategy at Weibo. Realizing fans value, so I, this is something that we talk a lot about these days. I think the, to answer that question, we first start have to think about what is the fans value. I think uh, before, brands think uh, they count the number of fans on their Weibo accounts and they think somehow there's some value. But I don't think that uh, a lot of brands truly understand uh, what's the real value of these fans. I think more and more now what we see is the true value of these fans is they can be your brand ambassadors. They will speak on your behalf. They create a word of mouth um, effect among their circles, their other friends. So they help you to do marketing and they also buy your stuff. So I think there's more and more evidence that we see that fans can generate real solid business value for brands. And that's what we call right now the fans economy. That's kind of the whole concept behind that. So in terms of how to realizing the fans value, I think three things. Start from you have to find quality fans first. I think there should no longer be brands just blindly uh, accrue uh, any fans. And I think they first have to identify who are their real target audience, uh, who are their real customers, who are their quality fans. And they have to find ways to uh, find them, recruit them, make them become your fans. Secondly, I think uh, once they become your fans, don't forget about continue to engage them, uh, you know, having different um, content, different marketing events, keep engaging with them. So that's the second thing that you have to do. And the third thing is more about thinking about social commerce. I think this is, you see more and more uh, examples now as well. There are new startup companies who have, uh, whether they're selling these fruit juice, they're selling smart scales, they're selling all kinds of very, these unique pr uh, products, and they actually sell these products directly to the fans on social media on Weibo. So I think the Realizing the fans value, uh, you know, the, the final stage is actually by creating that social commerce element and getting your fans to buy these products. At the same time, they will love your products. They will tell more people about your products, get more people to buy. So I think these are the three things the brand should think about when they try to realize the value of their fans. Thanks, Ken. We're back in our studio today with Karen Ho, Managing Director of Digital at MEC China. Hedy Wen, Head of Social at Omnicom Media Group China, and Sam Fleming, President of CIC. Welcome to our studio. Today we're talking about social commerce and social CRM efforts. Let's talk about how brands can unleash the real value of fans, and not just for branding, but also for sales. Um, Sam, let's start with you. Are you seeing a greater emphasis on um, you know, uh, commerce in the social marketing campaigns monitored by your company recently? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, sales has become, you know, a, a, a key aspect of uh, of the of the tracking now. Um, it's hard for us by tracking just social conversations. It's hard for us to get the exact sales, but we can look at things like purchase intent and how much people are talking about if they have bought the product or not. But I think another interesting angle that we're seeing in terms of sales is that it's the role of the uh, shops especially the, the small shops on, on Taobao or Tmall, in terms of promoting products and educating about brands. Right? So they may or may not be official sellers of different products or different brands, but they're educating uh, consumers about those brands. 
and sometimes even with a, a, a larger and more effective voice than, than the brand's official communications. How is this changing the role of social networks in the relationship between you know, businesses and consumers? Well, I think on that point, what's interesting is if you have social sellers, that doesn't actually fit into like paid, owned, earned media. This is another sort of retail media. Um, and brands uh, or advertisers don't always have control over these official or even unofficial shops. So I think that's one interesting challenge. Um, I, I think the other is, and this has sort of always been the case, but you know, the role of fans, especially key opinion leaders, uh, it, it continues to grow in importance. Um, and recognizing that that's the key opinion leaders and or celebrities as a key part of your media buy, if you will, in terms of getting the word out is uh, of critical importance. So do you think platforms like Weibo will become competitors to like Tmall or other similar uh, platforms um, now that they have all the payment systems added? Social media to kind of like bridge the path to purchase and to sales. Because um, we're working, we have a fashion e-commerce client and uh, that I can't disclose the name, but essentially it's high-end e-commerce fashion brand, not having a store in Taobao or Tmall. But we have been using, when we were working on with the brand when they first came to China, we pretty much are just saying that, okay, let's build a brand as well as focusing on sales because they are global brands. So essentially it's not like they don't have a sales target or anything. The company is actually well known or very highly result driven. So when we first started work of it, we actually use social media to build brand awareness, but more importantly to try to improve the conversion to sales. Um, we have been measuring it as well. So the conversion, conversion of like coming from social media actually much higher than from other, other, other media. So it's, it was more kind of like because we use social media to do not just for the awareness or product awareness, but education, the consumer education, to really bridge the connection of what customers need. Maybe they just don't know because it's an e-commerce from overseas. Maybe they don't know how to pay, um, how to go through the logistics, would they get trapped at customs or post office. So there are questions like this that we will be able to validate the information as well as uh, um, convince the consumers that this will not be a barrier. So with, uh, with a, simply a link to then drive people to the end sales page to make an order. And with the process like this, if you really thought it through and plan the content towards that, the conversion coming from social media was actually improved at least three times through the process. So at the end of the point, that at one, at one point, the client actually believed, and we believe as well, the social media, the conversion coming from social media was even better than search at that but I think they would say, well, it won't be always, but it happened. So, yeah, so that is actually very helpful. Yeah, to pick up the question uh, you're asking uh, whether Weibo is becoming the competitors with, uh, with uh, Timo and Jingdong. And actually, I think um, they're not competitors, but they are partners, especially, you know, back to 2013. Um, the, the Alibaba decided to buy a 18% share of uh, Weibo. Actually, back to that time, the marketers that we are talking about, we are actually expecting uh, this uh, strategic investment from Alibaba will make Weibo as a real ecosystem because from, you know, from our perspective, adding the experience of Alibaba's e-commerce cap capability, Weibo can really build an ecosystem, a you know, circle of ecosystem. It's no longer only be a, like a brand um, awareness platform, but also it can help these uh, brands to sell the real products to the consumers and also to influence these uh, consumers and followers on Weibo to buy the products within the Weibo uh, environment. And also you're talking about Weibo payment. Um, actually, this is a new function that Weibo added like uh, one, one year ago. And I noticed that the number that people using uh, Weibo payment already existing 35 uh, million. So that's a remarkable achievement given the time that uh, short time they launched. But compared to the, the, the other two dominate payment online system like uh, Alibaba's uh, Alipay and Tencent's Tenpay and, and WeChat payment, uh, it's still relatively small in terms of the sales volume and in terms of the user base. 
But I think uh, if the Weibo can approve, uh, can prove that people are actually using the Weibo payment to, to buy the products directly from Weibo, there will be more brands and more marketers to invest more money on the Weibo e-commerce. Can you give some specific examples of how marketers are using social media as a path to purchase and how you've built campaigns around this differently? I'll go first. <laughs> and then uh, Mac G2, not 2015, but 2013, we actually launched the first, uh, well, I would say second, Xiaomi was the first, Smart was the second campaign to use Weibo to sell, to sell cars. And essentially, because there was actually the third, um, the third campaign of selling selling smart cars on e-commerce platform, and so the first one we did was on uh, was on Taobao, with, um, actually Tmall when Tmall first launched. Second one we did it was on Jingdong, and as a okay, the second biggest e-commerce platform. The third year we actually did it on on Taob uh, on Sina Weibo. The reason behind it was a. Okay, you have, of course, in, on an e-commerce platform, people will be selling car, will be buying, and, and then, well, we sell car, and then people will be buying. We, those people are potential purchases to begin with. But after the first two years, we kind of like realized, hold on one second, one thing that we haven't leveraged or utilized is actually to nurture our fan base. We already have a huge fan base on on Sina Weibo for Smart. Um, why not giving them a special thing? Because they could they could be either the existing car owners, the the ones who love smart cars but may not be able to afford one yet, or they love the brand and they they're not planning to buy one but they love the brand. So this group of people are actually very influential among themselves, among their peers. So what we did a uh, Sina Weibo campaign is essentially to give them the option to buy, uh, to order and buy, and, and that is very focusing on the fan base only. We didn't do any promotion outside Sina, and just to focusing on this is a special offer for you guys, that you have the opportunity for the limited edition as well as a good financial policy um, that could essentially help you that if you didn't, if you could not afford it, now you definitely could. And so that was a great, campaign of really pushing sales directly and right. um, utilizing the fan base. Yeah. Yeah. And also I saw that uh, a few 3C brands such as like cell phone brand like Samsung and Huawei, they are very advanced in you know, leveraging the social media as e-commerce platforms. For example, Huawei, um, they're a cell phone brand named Owner that just launched a new Weibo flagship store. And the users can directly buy the products and new forms through Weibo using the Weibo payment. While not only you know click the link to another like Jingdong or Taobao uh, links to buy that. So within this uh, Weibo ecosystem, uh, users can really and this um, actually the brands can usually turn those uh, fences into their uh, uh, buyers because uh, Huawei already have more than one million users actually on their Weibo account. But but that would mean that the KPIs for your campaign would change. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, it's definitely mm -hmm. still straight, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And how does it change? Well, definitely, if you say ad hoc campaign like Smart, that time is definitely the sales as well as the sales leads, the potential leads that we could then yes. funnel through to the dealers um, for the fashion e-commerce client that I mentioned on the other case, that uh, we have been monitoring the conversion of sales coming from social media on a on a pattern perspective as well as uh, comparing it with other social with other media platforms so the, so in a way you are seeing that as of like are we driving sales from social media and how is it progressing we're not saying that that would be the absolute kpi but knowing how it's progressing and, and identifying the pattern out of it will help us to then fine tune content as well as the approach or campaign we are working with our fans yeah, so in the, in the traditional way that when we're looking at social performance, we will look at impressions, look at engagements, and, and also like uh, reposts and, and comments, those numbers. But in a, in, a, in a more social commerce way, like Karen just mentioned, that the clients would look at this uh, conversion rate, look at how, man, how many sales leads that we bring to their you know, uh, re actual sales. So those KPIs actually are really adding more challenge to our uh, you know, agencies and our you know, uh, staffs to create more value to the brands. And so, and I think this, we're seeing in the world of social listening, uh, the world that, that, that CIC operates in, 
you know, we're seeing sort of a shift. It used to be that you know, uh, clients want to know just their, their social media performance, as, as, as you were saying, which they still want to know. Um, but we're seeing that the social data now, it's being uh, combined with other sets of data. So you have social data, you have search data, you have sales data. You know, and I think the agencies like media agencies can, can analyze all of that together uh, to see what's really working. Um, but then the, L, the role of social, I think, within sales, in terms of driving sales, um, you can also see what's working within social. For example, uh, key opinion leaders, or you know, which KOLs, or which celebrities, or which users are actually driving, retweeting the content the most, or having the greatest influence on sales. So you're looking at social performance, but all in terms of you know, within the sales context. Let's go to, uh, let's talk about key opinion leaders for a second. You know, how they are um, active, being active on Weibo and how they encourage sales by doing a lot of the product and service reviews. Um, what are the costs to get them involved? And also any good examples of uh, KOLs being involved to, in, to not just for the branding, but also encourage sales? It could go easily from just at 1,000 to 100,000. Yes. That's the cost, cost. of, yeah, yeah, the cost it's of it. It's really varied <laughs> by different cases. It's a, different, it's a yes. cheaper price, we call it. Yes. Depends, depends who the agent is. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's more kind of like their, their, their number of fans and how influenced, how influenced or have they been. Yeah. yeah so there is a lot of factors on it, but the cost is really kind of like jumping up and down depending on product as well. It's, but right now, they don't have a separation between, oh, your post that you're posting me this time is branding driven versus sales driven versus review. And right now, they're not that separated yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still more kind of like, okay, I'm endorsing your brand. Yes. What is the content and how much is it per post and so on. So it's working effectively so far? For fashion, well, depending, yeah, it's really depending on the grip yeah, of our, yeah, yeah, for fashion brand, the fashion e-commerce, yes, like um, that we have been getting, we have been testing a big pool of it, but then you have been narrowing down for say, the stylists, makeup artists, and so and designers, but I'm sure for other different categories, it could go dangerous <laughs> because yeah. there are so many. Just like Karen mentioned that for the fashion brands, fashion retail brands, there is a client that I also cannot speak of the name, but uh, it's a fashion retail brand in China. It's very popular. And last year, they launched a new series, a new line of uh, clothes with another famous designer. And then they invited a lot of uh, celebrities and key opinion leaders online to promote their you know, new looks. Uh, they invited like a lot of stars and also like ad fashion editors and fashion bloggers like Gogo -Go Boy, and those you know those KOLs really put on their new looks on their social platforms and promote this new brand and new crossover, and the result is crazy because um, the the day when the when the new look launched, you know you can see in the, in the very early morning you can see a lot of people are waiting outside of the door just waiting for the opening, and you know all those clothes were sold out within 24 hours. So, so that's crazy. That's not for not only for branding, but also, like you said, for you know, increase the sales. Yeah. It's almost like we're creating a demand. Yes. Yeah, yes. those people could be if they play if we play it right, we could create demand like that. Mm -hmm. But I think we're also seeing um, the flip side of you know, the power of key opinion leaders is sometimes they don't work right, uh, or the celebrities don't work, or at least in the way that you think, and so. We're involved in a lot of what we call like KOL or celebrity audits. So we will, before, uh, before they launch a campaign, before a client or agency launches a campaign, they can give us the list of KOLs or celebrities they're looking to use, and we can look at things like the quality of their fans. So you know, what percentage of their fans are zombie fans, you know, for example. Um, also, uh, when they tweet commercially uh, about, about a product, you know, what's the performance of those tweets? You know, how many people do those tweets reach? Uh, and how many of those people are real people? Um, and so doing, you know, having this data-based audit as opposed to just a PR agency handing you a Rolodex of names, but having the data to, to really make sure that you have quality, relevant KOLs, um, I think can lend to success. And of course, after the campaign, uh, you, or after the launch or whatever it is, you can go back and measure those performance. And so, I mean, as a paid media, 
Uh, we do think that it's relevant and uh, practical to actually look at the performance, and you can use data to do that. And to, to turn that into a subjective thing to an objective thing. Yeah, exactly, because you can, I mean, it's not that difficult to build up a large fan base, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. that, that's what these guys do. What, what about consumers? Are consumers open to the more commercial side of social media these days? And if so, what are the key things to bear in mind for brands um, to avoid you know, this going to the opposite direction, essentially? I mean, from our perspective, I mean, we've been listening to social in China for 10 years. Um, I mean, key opinion leaders or social in general has always had sort of a, a commercial angle to it. I think uh, consumers are pretty savvy. They recognize that this is part of the deal. Um, and, but they also don't want you know, their intelligence to be insulted. So if it's overtly commercial, uh, or if the, if the KOL doesn't fit the image of the brand um, or the celebrity, whatever, then netizens will recognize that, especially in like the luxury fashion area. You see some KOLs are selected for a brand and you know, people will say that the, the brand is, or that, that KOL is beneath the brand. No. Um, and so I think they recognize the commercial side uh, of it, but then they also can be quite critical if it's if it's not the right fit. Yeah, I think um, also we actually did a research re recently. Uh, we call it a dive social um, to analyze the the people why uh, the motivation mo motivations of people why they go to social or use social media. Actually, there is a kind of person, a group of person who we call it a smart controller. And those people actually are very adapted to the social uh, apps and new social media um, technologies. So they are leveraging social media to manage their daily lives. So if a brand to promote something to, to them and, you know, maybe they can buy it through the, the, the link directly or even with discount or benefits, and those information to him would be valuable. So if he thinks this information is valuable, no matter it is commercial or not, they will accept it. And also, there is another kind of uh, archetype for people, we call it um, 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 connectors. And those people actually are going to social media to connect with their friends and keep updating about their friends and what they are doing. So if we can you know, leverage the, the technology to identify the relationships of the people on social media, to promote them something like what are your friends are wearing, what are your friends are buying and doing, and maybe you can look at. So those information to them will be relevant. So if you can also give information both valuable and both relevant to the consumers, I don't think they will be, you know, um, refuse it, but they will accept it and appreciate that. So to sum up, um, can you List one key thing a brand should keep in mind in realizing the value of fans online. From, from our experience, I think relevance. I think relevance of the key opinion leader to the brand or to the campaign or the communication. I think relevance of the content, um, just as you were saying, you know, to looking at your target audience, uh, making sure that it is know, relevant or useful or impactful for them. Because um, it's easy to get caught up in the trap of, again, getting that Rolodex of, you know, these people have millions of fans, so just get the word out there. Um, you can get the word out there, but is it getting to real people? Is it getting to the right people? And is it, you know, it, is it uh, getting the, the, the right kind of content? Well, he picked the best word, so yeah. I'm going the other way. It's going to get hard when it gets to it. <laughs> so I pick, I'm leaving you the last. <laughs> it's OK. Um, but I, I'm actually thinking the most important thing for the brands is to make sure they know what their objectives are to begin with. And then so they could, they could, they could define the, the role of social media to play with, towards the objective. Because with that in mind, then they could recreate the proper a throw content plan and what they can do with it, how they're gonna how they're gonna measure against it and everything. So without getting the objective in the row, everything just falls apart and it will be super chaotic at the last of the through the process later. Yeah, I think I just want to make it simple. It's just don't fool the audience because they are very smart. Hetty, Karen and Sam, thank you for joining us. 
You can visit the Weibo discussion site to interact with the guests on today's show, as well as other industry members. Access this site through the QR code on the screen here, or through Thoughtful's Weibo account at the link below. Well, that wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Youku, Tudo, and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo, WeChat, and Twitter, and join our LinkedIn group. See you again. Thank <laughs> you.